Welcome to Masterful Visions. I'm your host, Zebediah Barrett. We are back at it with another classic Wes Anderson film, Isle of Dogs. Today we're joined by Paul Glover. Paul, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Would you mind telling the people a little bit about Paul? Yeah, sure. Um, so I came to Henderson in 2005 um, to teach film and radio and television. That's kind of what I did for my undergrad at the University of Alabama. But even before that, I was a film lover and cinephile. I just didn't know the word cinephile until I got into <laughs> my 20s, <laughs> maybe 30s even. I still but, don't yeah. think most people know what cinephile that's right. is. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. So film lover. Yeah, always. So Isle of Dogs. Uh, tells a story of a group of dogs living on a trash-filled island off the coast of Japan and follows a young boy's quest to find his lost dog. Uh, I felt the animation was very, very similar to that of Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah, almost a carbon copy, like his style. It's Absolutely. almost like, let's use the same software, guys. <laughs> Got a deal, but yeah, it's very... Now, um, I believe it's stop motion. It's yes. So it's wax, is it wax figures, clay figures? I believe it's clay, but there's probably some other elements you could probably use in this day and age. Mm, but if, if he's took true to form, then it's clay. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, Isle of Dogs history. Why, why Isle of Dogs? Yeah. Um, so there was a... Uh, a theory that Anderson hated dogs. I don't know if you know that or not. Um, I didn't. He actually, in almost every movie, kills off a dog in one way or another. So the audience started to think, well, Anderson hates dogs. Um, and Isle of Dogs is kind of a uh, a kickback to that idea that he doesn't hate dogs, he actually loves them. Oh, it's very pro-dog. <laughs> it is very fact, pro-dog. It, does he hate cats? Because they get the short end of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're the true villains. Of I the guess story. so. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but uh, background wise, he actually has two movies that, or two ideas that specifically sparked this one. Um, the first being a movie titled The Plague Dogs. It was a British made traumatic children's film. Traumatic. <laughs> traumatic. That's the wording used for it. <laughs> uh, there was an interview with Anderson where he admitted that he was reluctant to admit this movie being uh, an inspiration for Isle of Dogs just because it's so bleak and Isle of Dogs is more cheerful. Sure, yeah. With, with its bleak moments, uh, you know, it, Isle of Dogs, I definitely wouldn't call it a children's film. No, not at all. <laughs> it's animated. It's fun in places, but I... Once it I, is, yeah, it is rated PG-13. Yeah, once I got into it, I was like, I was thinking, man, this is kind of COVID-related. I'm glad it came out before COVID, but um, it, it, I don't find it to be a children's film, so it's probably smart on his part to say, mm. hey, it's inspired by this other horrible film. Everybody, let's go watch it. <laughs> right. <laughs> let's so, encourage, yeah, let's yeah. encourage watching these I movies. Mean, it's, it's yeah. like Aesop's Fables. There's a great message in there, mm-hmm. like a lot of his films and little comments on society, and the animation does make it a little more kid-friendly. But, um, yeah, just even the actors uh, in it are not necessarily known as children's movies actors. Absolutely, and yeah. Except for Bill Murray, you know, Garfield maybe. Well, <laughs> uh, it could be argued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now that you mention it, let's go ahead and talk cast. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, Bill Murray... Great cast, um, yeah. Edward Norton, Jeff Goldblum, uh, Brian Cranston, uh, Scarlett Johansson, right, yeah. just huge names. Yeah. Um, and you have to wonder what the reasoning is. <laughs> True. You know, most of these actors uh, of that crew there have been in all of his films, like mm. Bill Murray and the Wilson brothers, which he, he met at college. Um, so, or at least Owen Wilson, I think was his roommate. Um, but and I don't know if this is coincidence or not, but being influenced by, I think, Akira Kurosawa, the mm-hmm. Japanese film director, and this is a very Japanese film. Absolutely. Um, one thing that Kurosawa loved to do, and, and some actor, other actors do, is they like to use the same people mm-hmm. over and over. There's just a vibe. They feed off each other well. Um, I'm sure they all get paid <laughs> very well, but still, I think some of the reason is these actors want to do the movie, and they'll, they'll do it because they love the art. Do you think there's a cutthroat uh, competition to get into Anderson movies these days? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to go with a solid yes on that. Uh, yeah. I think people fight to be in his movies and Tarantino movies. Mm. One, they're popular, and you're, you're probably going to make some money. But two, there's that artistic freedom 
that um, Hollywood allows those directors to have, and Hollywood mm. doesn't allow all directors to have that freedom. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And a lot of these directors and actors have moved over to Netflix and other places like that for the longer series. Oh, yeah. Because um, of the same reason. Edgar Wright, um, which I'll talk about later, yeah. his movie, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, is coming out with a series on Netflix. Right, yeah, yeah. So it's just, I mean, if you don't have opportunity in Hollywood, you'll have opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, I, you know, with these series and HBO and, and Netflix and Hulu and now it's Paramount and mm. Amazon. The list goes on and on. Uh, there are a lot of people are jumping over there and saying, yeah. look, we're not abandoning Hollywood, but over here we can still make some money, but we got more time to develop our craft and actually, you know, make some artful, you know, masterful <laughs> movies. Yeah, <laughs> right, absolutely. masterful visions. That's yeah, the name of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, at the word auteur, I think, mm. which, which we've talked about before, that's those are the directors that the actors want to do that for that are cutthroat in each other me- metaphorically. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, um, to get in their mood because they're auteurs. Right, and auteur is uh, just an author. Basically, um, you're you're an author of the pen, but also an author of the camera. That's right. Yeah, where your camera is the pen. Correct. And light to some degree, but yeah, that their their movies have a certain style. I don't think anyone makes Wes Anderson movies. No. And there's copycats, <laughs> but there's, well, there's not another Wes Anderson. Kind of like we talked about briefly um, before recording is that uh, Isle of Dogs is almost like a, a jab. It kind of feels like a jab towards a Tim Burton aesthetic. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, <laughs> you know that I can do it too. Yeah, 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 here's mine. Here you, Tim Burton, you take care of all the Halloween stuff, <laughs> the creepy stuff, a lot of black, a lot of shadow, but I'll use the whole color palette over right. here. And I'm sure they both do, and I'm, they're probably friends, but I'm sure there's a little bit of competition there. And uh, that makes me think of that that screenshot that you showed me. Yes. With the dogs, that's com- the dogs are completely dark, but mm-hmm. then you have that pop of color in the background of the bottles. Yes. You know, I when I was I was kind of I was really into the movie, and which is a good sign when you when you're so into the story that you're not really noticing the background a whole lot. But that one pops out so much. Mm. Uh, I had to remind myself where are they. And they were in an igloo made out of bottles, trash bottles, but it looked like candy in the background, (laughs) which, you know, also looks like a a Japanese parade, Mm. you know, just all these colors just bright popping out. It's art. And then, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the dogs were in complete shadow. It was a really good, cool scene. Yeah, there's a lot of silhouette in this movie. Yeah. I like what he does, too, with those repeated scenes, all the dogs walking in a single file. And then the background will change, but the dogs are still walking in a single file. He does this stuff. It's like it's almost like repetition um, that he does with the, the lines. The dogs are walking one way, but the background just keeps changing, but the dogs keep moving forward. And he mm-hmm. does that several times in his live-action films, too, and that's just part of his artistry. It's not just right. the colors. It's the way he makes his actors move around and walk and stare at the camera and it's just dialogue, all that. Yeah. Dialogue's huge, even though there's very little. Right, yeah, um, even in this movie, too, right. which is, is interesting. So I, I was looking up. Um, I, I did see the one criticism about the movie was that, you know, the Japanese dialogue wasn't subtitled and that a lot of it just was came from the expressions or them shouting and that mm. sort of stuff. And some people say, well, why wouldn't you put the, uh, the subtitle of the Japanese language or, you know, whatever the reason is. Um, but a lot of those expressions that the dogs and the characters had were over these over-exaggerated expressions would Absolutely. come straight from Kabuki, yeah. um, which doesn't have dialogue. Everything is the expressive mask. There's another type of theater and drama called the no-play that's a lot more subtle. Mm. Um, but Kabuki's like... That's like Kiss, you know. It's yeah. like the band Kiss of Kabuki. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you know that's they do with the explosions and all that kind of stuff. And I think he took a little bit from that with, especially uh, Domo, mm-hmm. the, the henchman, you know, yes. the big tall, the lurch of yeah. it, his expressions, especially. Um, so now that you're bringing up the Japanese culture, yeah, um, did you notice? Uh, I know you've studied it a little bit more than me, obviously. I try um, a lot more. <laughs> so, did you notice the insane details, like the way that they prepare the sushi um, in that one clip, and the yes. accuracy that's in that whole sequence? Absolutely. Um, the research that would have had to go into it on Anderson's side, being from Houston, Texas. Right. <laughs> obviously, you don't grow up knowing a whole lot about Japan. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so to me, that's another wild aspect of this movie. Yeah, I mean, you could tell he's either lived there or visited for a long mm-hmm. time or just he went native, as they say. 
that's what actually I'm glad you brought it up. That might be my favorite scene of the movie. Okay. Is the fish mm-hmm. cutting up the fish and the insane detail of pinning the fish, cutting the sushi. To so all. relaxing to watch. It was. It's <laughs> almost almost AMSR level yeah. <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, it, aside from that poor crab that tried to get away. Right. Like, nope. <laughs> but you're you're and, and going they, in whether you want to or not. That's right. <laughs> and it is a very detailed way of, like, we can get sushi everywhere, but real authentic sushi mm. uh, takes a long time to prepare. You have to cut it perfectly. Even the rice has to be perfect. Right. So it's not a, it, it, you know, sling you're the food kind of thing. And it's almost like he makes his movies like he, like they make Real sushi. It made me hungry, too. It did. <laughs> and then I figured out what cra- the... S- Why am I craving sushi yeah. all of a sudden? <laughs> I know, always. But then I figured out what the scene was, and even the scene with him, uh, spoiler alert, sorry, with the scientist dying, mm. it was very subtle. Like, his head just bowed. Right. And then you're out of it. It's just so uh, uh, delicate with that stuff. Yeah. yeah great like i mean like we said it's not a children's movie yeah um you have a lot of underlying things yeah um murder <laughs> being one of yep. them absolutely um uh, gor- uh, corrupt government mm-hmm. government cover-ups yeah dictatorship um, right yeah. there yeah. are so many ideas in this movie um that make it not a children's movie yeah. but to where you can watch it as a family sure. if you choose to yeah, yeah, that's true, too. Um, yeah, there's nothing uh, offensive in there. Right, but you just have to know how to deal with certain topics in yeah. certain ways without offending anybody. Yeah. Or, Which I think um, he does, again, masterfully. I think, right. I think he does that very well because I think that I, he not only did his research, it seems like he's just spent time over there, like any good filmmaker should because mm. the Japanese do films very well. Right. And they can say a lot with subtlety that some American filmmakers, you know, it's just all dialogue, all explosions, all action. Even Kurosawa's action <laughs> films. Have just take John Wick, for example. <laughs> I love John Wick movies, Great but movies. all you have to do is turn it on and go on for the ride yep. <laughs> a little bit. Um, and, and I'm not saying there's not subtlety. No, nothing wrong with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with it. But y- Japanese movies just, they say a thousand words with a picture, mm. and they're so good at that subtlety. Um, and I think uh, that Wes Anderson takes from that. And so it's for me, it's an it's an homage to Japanese filmmaking. Watching this movie. So how do you feel about movies that try to take on Japanese culture, and almost drop the ball like Pacific Rim? <laughs> um, <clears throat> to me, that was just an action film, though. Okay. I didn't really read that. Did me? I thought you were going to say that one movie, The Last Samurai. Where that Tom, one too. Yeah. Tom Cruise yeah. is the, the Last microphone. Samurai, yeah. uh, or I don't know if he's that actual character, but I, it's, it's hard for me to buy that. Like yeah. all these samurai running down the hill, and here comes Tom Cruise in a robe. I, just, <laughs> I can't buy it. So, so I, I, it just depends on the director and what the movie is for. Are you making it because you love art, or are you making it to make a buck? Mm. There was another one too, The Wall. Yes, with Matt Damon. With Matt Damon. I, yeah, just, you I <laughs> look. I'm a Matt Damon fan, and that movie was a struggle to get it through. It is, and, and it's, it's just it's, no work was put into it. It felt like to me, like yeah. the, you know, even acting, costume, CGI, it was all it's a money subpar. grab. Yeah. yeah, just a money grab, and so that that to me doesn't do anybody homage. No, yeah. <laughs> um, one that I've that I enjoyed a lot because it showed more of the mythology uh, mythological side yeah. of it. 47 Ronin. I haven't seen that one yet. It's always been on the list, though. It yeah. is, to me, um, <laughs> one of the better American depictions of Japanese mythology. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't even realize was part of. Like, it explains the whole... Um, what It explains what a Ronin is. Right, right. Yeah. Um, it explains the ceremonial suicide. It explains yeah. all of that. And I never knew any of that until that film. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's Which be- is better than taking a class, you right? Know, yeah. Watch this great film. You can learn a lot from it. Yeah, um, it kind of gets rid of the idea. This whole podcast gets rid of the idea that TV melts your brain. That's right. You're right. <laughs> you can learn you can from learn it. A lot. If I made you a know career out of watching for. too much TV. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, looking at the time. Let's talk um, briefly, even though uh, Isle of Dogs is whimsical and lighthearted. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, we already mentioned it touches on those those heavier themes. Um, would you consider Isle of Dogs thought-provoking? Oh, absolutely. If you know uh, a little bit about history, mm-hmm. um, you're a little bit civic-minded. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and you, even as a dog owner, uh, you can get a, or a pet owner in general, you can get a chuckle out of it too. Right. Because he takes, I think, some great pains in making sure the dogs are, their personalities are much bigger mm. than the humans uh, on there and their little subtle. One of the, the scenes that makes me laugh out loud is when um, Chief finally tells his backstory about a stray dog, and they all just sit down at the same time like, really? And they like, like sitting around the campfire. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Story, story, story time. Story time, yeah. Which the movie is. The movie right. is story time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one so. of the things that, that you said that, and it made me think of um, <laughs> when um, I'm trying to think of the boy's name. Um, and I can't think of it. Atari. Atari. Yeah, Thank which you. Which is great. <laughs> um, so when Atari is trying to talk to the dogs, and they're all like, "Man, I wish we could just understand what he was saying." Yeah, <laughs> that's my yeah, favorite yeah, yeah. part. Because I feel like we think about dogs that way. Mm-hmm. You know, they start barking. We're like, "Why on earth are you barking?" Oh yeah. Um, and there's just certain things that it's like it'd be so much easier if we could just talk to dogs. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know my cat talks to me. I mean, there's two things: outside or treat. <laughs> right, but she communicates a lot uh, with me, and I know that there. It's not talk. I know that I'm not a crazy person here, but um, but the, the, there's communication going on. That like oh, she wants something, and I want her to be quiet. So yeah, we need to negotiate. This. Tone of voice is huge too. Yep, yep, big time. Um, that, that brings me um, um, when you were. Uh, I don't know why it brings me back to the cast point, but yes. uh, the Yoko Ono mm-hmm. character is, was voiced by Yoko Ono. No way. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty neat, That too. is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a character that, that not a lot of people in society look favorably <laughs> beyond, broke up the Beatles, whatever, whatever side you're on. It was cool of Wes Anderson to go, hey, you know, I created this character. I have an Atari. I have a Yoko Ono here. Let's just go get Yoko. Yeah. <laughs> to, to voice it. I think that's pretty good. Um, and it's, whether he's doing it for face work, which I don't think he is, but saving face, I think, is a big theme in this movie, too. Like, the mayor ends up giving his lung, no kidney to mm. Atari to save face. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and the two big, you're talking about learning stuff from this movie, I think you can learn a lot about collectivism and individualism. Absolutely. Which is, you know, Western society, we're very individualistic, and Eastern society is very collectivist. Mm. And so the dogs are very collectivist, right? They always have to take a vote. Um, and when he's, finally, the individuals, uh, uh Chief and Atari are the ones that break off because they're the individuals, and then right. the, the the rest of the dogs go through the incinerator. You know? Yeah, spoilers, but yeah. that was the part that oh, man, my wife almost turned off the TV. Oh, yeah. She was like, "He's killing more dogs." I know. <laughs> I was kind of wondering when it got to be about five minutes. Yeah. Like, I know we got to get back to this. But yeah. What's, yeah, what, yeah, what's going on here? But yeah, so so but that's two themes I really saw a lot is, you know, you got the um, Tracy who's very individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and when she, even when she's talking to the class about her conspiracy theories, you know, the, all the class is looking at it. That's very collectivist. Like, Absolutely. You know, we're, you know we are, are we all together or are we just one here? Mm. And that, that's played out throughout the movie, I think, with the dogs and uh, um, the characters and the government, too. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Well, when you watch it two or three times, <laughs> you get to, <laughs> start taking notes. And like, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I loved it. I could watch it two or three more times. It's that enjoyable. Okay. So that being said... Um, if you are into um, stories about pets, um, if you're a fan of animation, stop motion, Japanese culture, yes. <laughs> or even dogs, mm-hmm. um, we'd recommend checking this movie out. Yeah. I, it is an absolute artwork. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm no Rotten Tomato, but 100% over here. <laughs> yeah. I, no flaws for me. <laughs> uh, so... Um, I hope you all enjoyed learning more about the one and only Wes Anderson and his unique and memorable directing style. Um, Stay tuned for the next episode where we'll discuss another one of Anderson's works. Paul, thanks for being on today. And uh, if those who enjoyed Paul, he will be on again. Yep. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you soon on Masterful Visions. (laughs) 